Hello, everyone, and welcome to Backyard Farmer, coming to you from the Nebraska State Fair. We are so glad to have our great audience here, and of course, we are going to spend the next hour answering all those gardening questions. Remember, this is a taped show, so we cannot take your phone calls. You can still send us those emails to byf at unl.edu for a future show. Give us all that information, send us good pictures, we'll give you a good answer. And as always, we start with samples, and Jody has a very interesting one tonight in multiple boxes. What is it? So I brought evidence and or the culprit of those window wasps. So we had a couple cooler days, people were opening their windows and they found some stuff. So here I've got some grass, and these are from the grass-carrying wasp. And so it's kind of a mess. <laughs> so what the wasps, they're like, we've got social wasps and solitary wasps. These are all solitary wasps. And so the difference is where they build their nest and what they use to provision that nest. So these grass carrying wasps, they love to use the window wells and the window tracks of bedroom windows, bathroom windows, and they provision those nests with tree crickets. So if you see this, that's what that is. And this, and here I've got something that makes these mud nests and it is actually called an Asian mud dauber. These ones are also built in the window and they can be separated. And I'm gonna show you something kind of cool in a second. So when you find these and there's a hole, that means the wasp has emerged. And what is in these, they're provisioned with spiders. And I opened up because that's what entomologists do in their free time, one of those mud tubes or mud nests. And these are all different spiders. But you can see there's 20, 30, 40 spiders. So when we don't like wasps, they are doing some beneficial things, especially if you don't like spiders. But if you open up your windows and you find these little nests, it is a solitary wasp that did that. All right, awesome, Jody. And I do not like spiders, so that's uh, a lot of spiders. All right, Rock, what do we have today? So today I brought in honey vine milkweed, which is very similar to common milkweed, which is very desirable for pollinators. And actually, honey vine milkweed is very desirable for pollinators as well. But these pods can produce a lot of seed, plus it's a perennial. And the trouble with the vining type milkweed is although it has all the desirable characteristics, it's native, it's perennial, it attracts pollinators, it will smother small bushes and plants and um, tomato plants in a garden if it happens to be in your garden and can actually keep them from growing because the leaves can't see the sun and then they can't do the thing that produces food and tomatoes and that sort of thing. So we actually recommend that you try to control or eradicate these. There's really no suggested recommendation for a herbicide. But there is, a, you can pull them up and realize that they're a perennial, so there could be more, and make sure you don't let it go to flower. Common milkweed is a much better pollinator, plus there's a lot of other pollinator species out there that will not smother, literally smother your small shrubs and your, and your tomatoes and, and your potatoes in your garden, because they can grow somewhere in the neighborhood of six to 10 feet um, in two to three days. So just be aware of that. So, this is, this is not honey vine milkweed, and it's, I don't consider it desirable. People that are bona fide pollinator people love it because it does do a good job for monarch butterflies and other things. But we have other better species that are less invasive um, All right. than honey Thanks, vine milkweed. Rock. Perfect. And it'll also, you know, smother your children if you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> so, Amy, what did you bring? So I brought a peony for my garden, and this has peony leaf spot. It's a fungal disease. It's caused by a cladosporium. Um, this is a disease we typically see early in the season. We got these nice big brown spots. Um, usually back in May is usually when we see it. For me this year, this actually came in a little bit later due to the fact that I didn't have rain in May and June, and I finally got rain in July. So it's a little bit later onset. But even now in August, it's starting to kind of go like gangbusters. The temperatures were cool this week. Um, and so I have a lot of leaves that are looking really scorched for it. So how am I going to manage this? This is not one that I'm going to use a fungicide for. This is all residue born. So the big thing is cutting down your peonies, cleaning it up, getting rid of as much residue as possible, either this fall or this spring before they come up. And you should really reduce your incidence of peony leaf spot. 
Excellent. Thank you, Amy. All right, Elizabeth. <laughs> we don't know, do we? But we don't know. We don't know. know, but this is your friendly PSA. So walking around the fairgrounds out here, we found this sample. Um, what it is, is it is a sycamore. Or, um, you know, there's London plane tree, but more than likely a sycamore. This is a healthy one. So as you can tell, this one is not quite right. And so the thing to keep in mind is if we have something that doesn't look quite right, we have to do a little bit more digging. Um, we are suspecting that it could possibly be caused by some type of growth regulator her herbicide. The hard part is, is it is pretty much the only plant in the area that is showing these symptoms. And this plant was taken on the other or a few feet away in the same general area of the kids zone out here at State Fair. So sometimes when you give us a sample, it doesn't tell the whole picture. So we've got to do a little bit of extra digging around to see what could possibly be the issue. Um, we saw there was a hydrant near this guy. We're not, we're kind of wondering if it could be related to something that someone mixed up there, but we don't know. Um, so we need to get the full story before we can make an, a, a true um, diagnosis for some of these. All right. And her point, of course, is if it doesn't look right, it's not right. It's not right. Pretty much. All right, Elizabeth, you get the, f or uh, sorry, like? Jody. <laughs> We're going to start backwards because <laughs> we always slight the hort chair. <laughs> All right, Jody, your first one is, uh, what is this flying insect that is digging in the garden? Okay, this is a cicada killer wasp. They prey on the cicadas, which are out in full force, screaming in the trees. Right, and they won't bother you if you don't bother them. Correct. They may bother your garden, though, because they like the full sun and the well-drained soil. So water that area, and you can shoo them away or hit them with a <laughs> racket if you want to. All right. You have another uh, stinging insect this time. This one comes to us from Pleasant Dale. Uh, she puts out grape jelly for the Baltimore Orioles, and instead she got these critters, and she wants to know... Uh, can she, should she leave the jelly out to encourage, will that encourage them to overwinter here? No, so these are yellow jackets. There's actually several things on there, but I think she's worried about the yellow jackets. They are nesting in the ground somewhere, maybe nearby, but they'll come back every year. Uh, if you want to feed the Orioles, you can't let the birds eat without letting the wasps because they're so small. They'll get through any kind of mesh. So it's not encouraging them. They're going to find something sweet anyway. All right. Your next one, uh, Jody, has three pictures associated with it. It comes to us from Omaha. This is a red oak, and they're seeing some progressive uh, worsening. Started out with these holes in the trunk. They, uh, the, the viewer did say, she said, take that turf away from the base so you don't have the turf against it. Getting worse and worse and worse. So uh, what do we think? Okay, so there are some insects that do bore into red oak. There is actually two different red oak borers. One's a beetle and one is a clear wing moth. Unfortunately, I can't tell from these wounds if these are borer marks. Usually their borer marks are very like clean holes. And so it would be nice to see a better sample, but this tree overall looks very unhealthy. All right, thanks, Jody. And you have one more question, and this one comes to us from Lincoln. And uh, she sent a picture. She thought maybe this looked like a uh, dragonfly or a baby dragonfly. Is she right? It's close. So this one's a damselfly. So damselflies and dragonflies in the, in the same order. Damselflies are a little more delicate, and they hold their wings together when they're at rest. All right, perfect. Rock, you're next in the hot seat. You have three pictures on this first one. And no, this is not kudzu. We're not in the south. But uh, this comes to us from Little Sioux, Iowa, and uh, this is across the street from their house. So they look at this. It's this viney weed. It's attached itself to everything in sight. Uh, she wants to know what it is, and I think the second two pictures show us we know exactly what this is. Yeah, this is burr cucumber, which is um, a native but it's, an, it's also an annual. But the amazing thing is, is it, it has a greater growth rate than the honey vine milkweed we showed you earlier. And it really can. You can see how that would smother a tree or, or a shrub or anything it came in contact with, including the young children that Kim mentioned earlier. Um, 
and it is a prolific seed producer, and the, bur the, the cucumber looking like things on them that apparently are edible, I've tasted them, they're really bitter, not a big fan, but um, at the end of the day, you, she doesn't want them in her neighborhood, and I can understand her, but, but the neighbor already has them. So she's gonna have to keep her eye on potential encroachment um, into her yard, and then think about what to do to control that. And there's a lot of pre-emergent herbicides, like pendimethalin-based products, and you know, Scott's, or excuse me, the, uh, the preen product, um, that we, we use in your vegetable gardens. We'll actually do a reasonable job as long as you put on at least two applications in the fall, excuse me, in the spring. Um, and then you'll control this burr cucumber. But once it gets up, you, you, you can generally tell it by the shape of the leaf. It's a very characteristic leaf shape. Um, and then you can, you can hand pull and, and get them out of there. But that's a very healthy infestation. And by healthy, I don't mean good on that, on that house because they're, they're smothering those plants. All right, thanks, Rock. And you have one picture on the next one. Uh, this comes to us from Cozad. It says they've been trying to remove these burrs from the lawn. They've gotten them out of the sides of the driveway, but now they're seeing little bitty ones about an inch or two inches, and they still have these burrs on them. What are these and how to get rid of them? So this, this is grassy sand burr, and they describe it perfectly in that, you know, later in the season, it'll grow up and it'll only get about an inch and a half tall, and it'll still produce a seed head. Um, it's called grassy sand burr for a reason. That's a prickly kind of thing. They're very adventuresome to be in there eradicating it without a chemical application. But the best way to control grassy sand burr is once again with the pre-emergent in the spring. But unlike crabgrass, which we say put on, you know, tail end of April, early part of May, it germinates later. So you need to put your applications on a little bit later in the season if they want to target those. But once again, she had described it perfectly. It's grassy sand burr, and it's not a desirable weed species in your garden or your lawn. All right. Thanks, Rock. Amy, you have uh, three pictures for mm -hmm. this first one. This comes to us from Waverly, Iowa. They've never seen these kinds of spots on tomatoes before. They're hard uh, in spots when you cut them up. Only one plant in the row is affected. She's wondering what causes this. So what we have here is classic tomato ring spot. It is a virus. And you can still eat those tomatoes. They don't, it, sometimes it will stay hard, um, but you can eat them with no problems. Most likely the plant was infected and you just didn't see the symptoms when you bought it. Um, typically earlier in the season, I would tell you to rogue it out so you didn't spread to your other tomatoes, but with it being the end of August, you're probably good to go. Um, because the rest of your tomatoes are looking good, but it is tomato ring spot virus. All right, Amy, you have uh, two pictures on the next one, and this comes to us from Shenandoah, Iowa, speaking of peonies. Uh, she said these are several years old. They haven't really grown much. They haven't looked great this summer at all. And she's wondering, is this a fungus among us and what to do about it? So once again, on this leaf spot, just like the sample I brought today, this is uh, peony leaf spot is a fungal infection. Um, but in general, you see the peonies don't look real healthy. They're kind of yellow in coloration. Um, you know, she said it's fairly, they've only been in the ground for a couple of years, right, Kim? Right. So one thing I would be looking at is <clears throat> with it being such a young planting where they planted too deep, peonies are very, very sensitive on how deep they're planted. I would check um, planting depth, um, but also probably be a good idea to also do a soil analysis to see if we're missing any nutrients to potentially uh, add a fertilizer this fall or next spring on those peonies. But the leaf spot isn't going to kill it. Um, it will not even cause premature defoliation. It just makes your peonies look awful um, until you get that first killing frost. All right. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Elizabeth, you have three pictures on the first question here. This comes to us from Murdoch. The tree was planted four years ago. It's always had this curled leaf problem. And then there are holes in the trunk of the tree. And she's wondering, is this environmental or insect or fungal or both? And should she replace this tree? You know, at this point in time, I would go ahead and leave that tree in in that location. Um, depending on how it progresses and what kind of um, way that that tree was brought in, if it was a containerized tree, if it was a bald and burlap tree, that can make a difference. You know, if we're not seeing that root flare where the trunk enters the ground, we could have a planting depth issue. And the, ha the problem with a planting depth issue is sometimes it doesn't always kill the tree right away. Or if we have a stem girdling root, what we can see is it can compound. 
Um, there are a few insects, like Jody mentioned, like the carpenter worm that can get into these trees. Um, we'll need to see the, either the pupil case or the hole to get a positive identification. So I wouldn't write off this tree. However, I would take a look at the location of that tree. And if that tree does decline and die, we, I believe, are under a power line. So yeah. we need to make sure that we pick a tree that's going to be smaller and not grow up into that power line. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. You have uh, two pictures for the next one. Uh, this comes to us from Springfield. <clears throat> Excuse me. He planted eight small trees in the last four years. All of them have sort of this weird damage. Pears, cherries, peaches, maples. He does cover with white plastic protectors in the winter, keeps them watered. Um, what do we think is going on here? So a lot of those trees happen to be thin bark. And so I'm thinking what we have is because we're having it on multiple species, we could have it as a, re a result of putting that um, like white drain tile or something around it. And if we get um, animal that moves it or the wind moves it, sometimes we can get that rubbing up and down on the trunk of the tree and it causes the damage that way. So that is a possibility of what we're seeing across the board there. All right. And what to do? Nothing really to do at this point in time. Um, the main thing is to make sure that they're adequately watered so that way they're not drought stressed on top of it. Um, we want to leave them open to the environment. Unfortunately, once we start to see that oozing and kind of weeping coming out of that, um, unfortunately on some of our species, it's only a matter of time before they're going to need to be removed. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, gardening is a universal activity that can bring families and communities together. For our first feature tonight, we visited a gardener in David City who came to us from Brazil to do just that. In Brazil we have uh, it's like 12 hours in Brazil at uh, the rainforest we have 12 hours of light every day and then those lights because you have the canop doesn't go through 30% or 40% of the lights go through the, to the rainforest. That's the way that I try to do over there with the tarp. The tarp, it just allows like 30, 40% of, of the sunlight. What's happening, especially with the lettuce, if you, if you have more than 12 hours of sunlight a day, the plant is gonna think that it's time to reproduce. They're gonna grow and they're gonna go the flower is going to come up. That's not what I really want. I want to eat the, the leaves. I don't want to eat the, the flowers in that particular case. So that's why I have uh, the tarp over there. And then it's, it's because we can have the possibility to grow twice. Usually uh, I don't disturb the soil. So what I try to bring is uh, some topsoil and some compost because I have a compost pile here and I have a compost bean. So I try to use the resource that I have here to build my, my soil. And I, we can regenerate uh, because I'm trying to minimize the impact that I have on the soil. So basically I have the, the mobile system that it's like a, a cover. Uh, it's not exactly, but it's, uh, it's, it's mobile. Every time that I go raise a bed, I try to replicate the same top that I have there in here because when the kids come here and put the seeds on the ground, they need some, some shade. Like in the beginning, the seed is under the ground, they need shade. It's like to, to initiate, to start the process of growing. So that's a big top, that's a mini top, that's the way that I got, I'm going to move like one bed here and another bed here and this, this is the process that we go. And then the next year, the, we're going we're gonna to have some cover crops here. Um, it it's, it's depends on what is, what is the purpose of the cover crop. But the cover crop, we want to maintain the soil cover. That's the way the Brazilian do. We, we try to take all the resources that we have inside the forest, like roads and branches and and the mulch that we have on, it's like on the top soil, then we can generate like um, a special environment to grow. Here in Nebraska, it's a, it's a little bit different because we don't know exactly uh, uh, what you're gonna do 
to, to, to control the weather. And in Brazil, we cannot control the weather. Of course, we cannot control the weather. But what's happening there, we know that every day at four o'clock it's gonna be raining and the temperature is gonna be around 95 degrees, 96 degrees, and that humidity is so high, it's like 100% every day. But in Nebraska, some days it's 45 degrees in the morning, and the afternoon, it's 90 or maybe 95 degrees. So what we're trying to do is like to adapt all the, the techniques that we used to have there. And the, for many generations, we bring down here. But the, the most important thing is, is the sense of community that we have in Brazil. So in Brazil, when people are gonna start a garden, it's like the neighbors come to join you. I feel that Nebraska does have two but uh, I need the persons like in the community, like a local leader, to be involved in the process. A big thank you to Sandro for sharing that beautiful garden with us, and of course his philosophy on the fact that gardening does bring families and communities together. And that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, insects next. Jody, you have one question, or one picture on this one. This comes to us from Hardington. Uh, small iridescent dark blue beetle feeding on small willows every fall for the past few years. She wants to know uh, identification and is it, does she need to do anything about this? Okay, depending on what that willow means to her, usually they're just a really big pest for a short time, but it's a type of flea beetle that we have quite a few metallic, really pretty blue flea beetles around, and many of them will feed on willow. Um, it's an Alticus species or genus, and there's a lot of different ones, but there's not really much to do. If you want to tap them into soapy water, that plant is pretty damaged anyway, so it's not going to save that particular one. But they're awfully pretty. Yeah, they're beautiful. <laughs> All right, uh, two pictures on the next one. This comes to us from Lincoln. He uh, saw these critters on a yellow magnolia sapling in Lincoln and uh, wonders what in the world is this beast? It looks like bird poo, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, and that's its defense mechanism. But they turn into beautiful eastern tiger swell butterflies. So those yellow ones with the black stripes, that's just an early instar, and uh, sweet magnolia and tulip tree is one of their host plants. So yeah, don't, don't worry about it. It's going to be beautiful. Oh my goodness, it does look like bird poop. It's defense mechanism. All right, uh, two pictures on the next one. Uh, and, and first of all, they apologized for, for killing these creatures. Uh, he set out sticky traps trying to catch everything else uh, that was eating and got these two spiders. Uh, he thinks they're wolf spiders. He knows they're good, but he doesn't know what they both are, and he wants your opinion. Yeah, so th thank you for the apology. Um, I do love these spiders. They are wolf spiders, so he is correct. They're in um, the they're tigrosa species. So like <coughs> I think that means tiger wolf. And they are going to get caught on glue boards because they're active hunters. So they are wandering around. So they're more likely to get stuck in glue boards than any other, other spiders. But that's not what was bothering his plant, I believe. No, it was not the spiders. And <laughs> I just don't like wolf spiders. I you don't like any spiders. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> I like Charlotte. <laughs> Charlotte's web. <laughs> All right. Uh, Rock, you have one picture on this first one. And yes, Amy, he gets this because corn is a grass. <laughs> this comes to us uh, from North Kearney in Buffalo County. And it's not what he expected. Uh, this is glass gem, which is a, uh, it's a very beautiful and very heirloom corn. What is this rock? Yeah, and it's not surprising you see it on flint corn like you do, but it's a corn smut, um, which in most people would pitch that ear. But the amazing thing is, is corn smut um, is extremely edible. It's a fungus in the Eustilago family, um, genus, excuse me. And it is in that stage where it's white like that, you can slice it up and put it in a salad or put it on your pizzas, or you can wait till it gets to the more black, ugly stage and put it in gravies. And I, I personally um, like it in a couple of Mexican dishes that my wife makes. And it's an amazingly 
earthy mushroom flavor. So I know Kim gave it to me because I talk about eating corn smut all the time. And it's, it's got another name for it. The culinary experts call it uh, wheat la coche. And they're serving it in you know, finer restaurants all over as a delicacy. And there are people that are harvesting these on purpose because they can get five times the price for pounds of the corn smut that they get for the corn itself. Which is really cool. Yeah, really cool and really strange. <laughs> <laughs> and very tasty. <laughs> All right, uh, you have two pictures on the next one, Rock, and uh, this comes to us from Trenton, Nebraska. She wonders, what is this stuff? It is taking over her buffalo grass lawn, and what should she do about it? Yeah, this is yellow nut sedge. We've talked about it a lot on previous shows. It's a perennial, re regrows by tubers, very aggressive. There are fairly good, you can hand pull it um, early in the season when you first see it, um, when, when it's not as obvious as it is now because it's outgrowing the buffalo grass in this particular instance. You can hand pull it, or there are herbicides called like sedge ender and, and sedge away that do a pretty good job of uh, removing that um, eradicating that, but you've got to get that first of two applications on um, in the early, in, early in June. All right, thanks, Rock. And you have one picture on the next one. Uh, this comes to us from Lexington. It says there was a car show in their park over the weekend when it was over 100 degrees. Several of the cars were parked in the grass. When they left, these were the dead spots. And their question is, will they recover or is it time to start over? Uh, that's a maybe. I wish I could give a more definitive answer. I'll tell you what, if it's green in a month, it recovered. <laughs> and if it's not green in a month, it didn't. But it looks, it looks damaged enough to me, and I don't really see the, um, any kind of green tissue down below when I blow that picture up, when I look at it. So I'm going to say that, that they probably need to consider overseeding or reseeding those areas. And I think the heat combined with the traffic and everything else, and um, we just it's toast. <laughs> Reseed it. All right. Thanks. Amy, uh, you have three pictures on this first one. This is a Lincoln viewer with prairie gold aspen. Uh, the leaves have been turning black and shriveling, starting at the top, and now it's showing up on the lower leaves as well. They've been in the ground for a couple of years. These trees are on a slope with heavy clay soils. Okay. So this one I took a long time to look at. There's multiple things that could be going on. Number one, I would want you to go and look at the trunk and make sure you don't have a canker anywhere on that uh, that is inhibiting that movement of water. You're also in Lincoln and heavy clay soil on a slope. So my question is going to be, what is your planting depth of that tree and how well are you watering it overall? Um, heavy clay soils are going to hold your water, but they also get really hard fast. And so, and with it being on a slope, it also makes it more of a challenge to make sure your tree is getting the appropriate water that it needs. And then the last thing Elizabeth um, likes to talk about this one is making sure you're looking at the base of that tree and making sure you're not having any root skirtling around it that could be suffocating it a little bit as a whole. So you need to go back, take a full look at that tree, look at the, look at the, the roots, look at the flare, and also look at the trunk to see if you're seeing anything um, occurring there. All right. Thanks, Amy. Uh, you have two pictures on the next one. This okay. is a Lincoln viewer that said these dogwoods, uh, he doesn't say which, probably red twig, mm -hmm. are on a slope. They get morning sun. They are irrigated. They're wondering what are the spots that are showing up and what can be done about it. Okay. This is another fungal leaf spot that we'll find on dogwoods. Uh, we're going to see it in dogwoods that are definitely very full. We're not getting a lot of ample air circulation through there. And so it doesn't typically cause the tree to die, and it won't cause it to prematurely defoliate. Um, sanitation is going to be key because it's going to overwinter in those dead leaves. So sanitation, and if you really don't like it, maybe you need to prune out your dogwoods this fall or next spring before they bud out just to increase that airflow because dogwoods can get pretty, pretty uh, dense. And, per, and prevent that wa air, sorry, not water, air from moving through it properly. All right, thanks, Amy. Uh, two more pictures on this one. This comes to us, uh, let's see, I don't remember where here, but elderberry, that are, the leaves are turning black. They've had several plants, all the others are fine. <sighs> there are a few <laughs> leaf spots, but they are not matching up to this picture. And I can't remember where they were from. Emaha County. Okay. Yeah. I, 
I would probably look at a water issue maybe, um, maybe planting depth on those elderberry um, just because it's brown on the tips, on the edges. There isn't an anthracnose or, uh, that we would see in a lot of our other trees and bushes. So I would look at water as probably my main culprit for this one. Make sure you water them really good this fall if we don't get any great fall rains, um, just to help those plants to get through the winter and see what happens next year. All right. Thanks, Amy. Elizabeth, uh, two pictures on the first one. This is an Omaha viewer. Uh, three-year-old peach tree that needs to be trimmed. She knows not now, uh, but she does want to know how to prune it and whether, in fact, that she should prune differently on the side toward the house and also because it is shaded by some larger trees. So when we talk about our fruit trees, we really want to avoid pruning for the first couple of years because we want it to become established. Um, after that, we want one-third trunk to two-thirds canopy. And also with peaches, we usually wait for early spring as being that ideal time frame so we can see um, the overall branching structure. Now, those that are in like the peach family, we want to prune them a little bit differently than we do our shade trees. We want them to look like a starfish. Um, we want them to have multiple leaders that come up and we want them to look like a, a starfish. So we do have a neb guide, I believe, on pruning fruit trees. And I'd take a look at that. If not, I, we do have several other publications that'll help them out to make sure that we get it pruned properly while it's young. So you can have a peach tree for at least five more years. <laughs> yeah, I know you are not a fan of peaches <laughs> because you think they don't live. I think they're short lived in parts <laughs> of the state. All right. Three picks on the next one. This is a crab apple. This comes to us from Ceresco. Uh, she said it was prof planted professionally about uh, 2021 been watered consistently, uh, but it's showing this. Yep, any time that we have that canopy thinning or canopy dieback, that's usually a good indication to take a look a little bit closer to the ground. Um, when we take a look at closer on the ground, we've got some cracks, we've got some, some other canker type things popping up here, and I'm not seeing a lot of root flare. So I am suspecting it could possibly be planted a little bit too deep. The only way to really know is to dig around the base of the tree and see if we can find those flare roots. It also depends on what your soil type is like. Um, if you've got a heavier clay soil, you're going to want those first set of flare roots a little bit higher up um, compared to those of us in central Nebraska, we would have them at grade. So, you know, I do a little investigating, a little digging to figure out kind of what's going on with that tree. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. And you have one more. Uh, this comes to us as an ash. He's wondering what this wet spot is, but we are a little more concerned about what caused it. You know, I am because I believe he's from Lincoln, correct? Right. And so um, emerald ash borer has been confirmed in Lincoln for one. For two, the way that that tree has co-dominant leaders or it has two stems that are coming out and we're seeing the included bark in between those co-dominant leaders and then we add the crack on top of it where we can see the crack down into the trunk of the tree. Um, so, you know, my recommendation just based on the species and the location and the damage that we have going on, um, probably removal is going to be your best bet with this kind of tree. I know it's not what anybody wants to hear, but I think long term that's going to be the safest option. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Well, it's been another absolutely beautiful year in our garden, and despite the heat, it's looking great. Let's take a minute to hear from Terry out in the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden, our temps have really lowered a bit. So we are looking at the garden and seeing it really flourish still in this wonderful early fall time of the year. We're also taking a look at our new raised beds. Remember we put all these new raised beds in this year and we're really liking them. Our bigger, taller raised beds, we're actually gonna make at least one of them into a low tunnel. So we're going to extend our season in the backyard farmer garden at least for our veggies, and see how long we can start keep growing some of those cooler season crops. So we have some metal supports that we're gonna put up and we're gonna put some plastic over it and we're gonna start planting some of those lettuces, uh, radishes, and a lot of those cool crops. And hopefully we can have some fresh lettuce and radishes well into our Thanksgiving season. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right now, of course, it is time for the Plants of the Week. 
the plants of the week. So a lot of times when we're selecting plant material, everybody cares about what the flowers look like. Well, this is your reminder to select those plants for multiple seasons of interest. So what we have is we've got a gray dogwood here with these white berries. Um, you know, it does bloom in the spring. It's got good fall color, and then it has these berries in the fall. The other one is the American cranberry bush viburnum um, that has those red berries. And this is another good hardy shrub um, across the state. It does really well, but we want to make sure we select those shrubs for multiple seasons of interest, not just for their flowers. Perfect. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> All right, uh, Jody, three pictures on this first one. This comes to us from Furnace County. Sure. Uh, these insects are on most of her tomatoes. Are they harmful and are they causing the damage? And she sent us three really beautiful pictures here. Yeah, these are good pictures. So these are stilt bugs and they look like they are on stilts. But, um, and they have been known to be a pest in like greenhouse tomatoes, but they aren't usually doing too much damage that would prevent a good harvest of tomatoes. And then the picture that was shown there, they are not the culprit doing those holes. That is probably a caterpillar if it is an insect, so not the stilt bugs. All right, uh, and that's the damage that's kind of being shown, so. Yeah, those are not from the stilt yeah, bugs. That's other creatures. Yes, <laughs> something chewing. Okay, uh, you have two pictures on the next one. This is a beans question. And the beans on this one, uh, we've had this before. We couldn't quite figure out what this was. Two picks on it. He said it, the crud was spreading to his pole beans, and he got, was able to get us finally some really good pictures of the culprit. So what do we have going on on, on okay. uh, the so beans here? So it's interesting because my first thought were um, like flea beetles, but these are actually called... Uh, garden flea hoppers. So they're in the true bug family. So they are sucking the plant sap out of those leaves. Um, I don't know how his bean harvest is doing, but in the future, if he sees these again earlier on, then he could pretty much treat with any like pyrethroid. All right. One pick on the next one. Uh, he says, this is a half dollar size. What is it? <laughs> oh, yes. This is a wheel bug. So it's a predator and has a really pointy thick beak. You don't want to be pierced by that, but it's a really great predator of our other insects, especially Japanese beetles. All right. And another one. This is a Bellevue viewer who said was away for about a week and came back and found these caterpillars that are decimating his uh, landscape. Yeah, I don't know what plant this is, but these are sawflies, so they're not caterpillars. They're the larvae of a, a stingless wasp. So next time you see them, if you see them early enough to save the plant, just pick them off and dump them in soapy water. All right. Thanks, Jody. Rock, you have one picture on the next one. Uh, this is a, a Shelby, Iowa viewer. What is this weed? Roundup and 2,4-D won't do a thing. Uh, this is day flower. Um, it's a perennial. It's got an inconspicuous blue flower. Some people think it's pretty. I think you can barely see it. Um, it is fairly invasive in the garden, or at least uh, the very least intrusive. Um, most of the herbicides don't do much to it. Uh, you can pinch it back with glyphosate and, and some of the other products. But once again, there's a product called sulfentrazone, also known as Sedgender, that when you combine that with a broadleaf herbicide, has proven to be fairly effective in giving you about 60 to 70 percent control. So multiple applications in a year and then multiple applications over multiple years. All right. Thanks, Rock. You have two picks on the next one. This comes to us from Elm Creek found this in a very crowded flower bed near the street. She let it grow because she thought it was something she wanted and now she thinks she made a mistake. What is this? Uh, this is maple leaf, ma maple leaf goosefoot. Um, you can tell the leaf kind of looks like a maple and it is an annual and I don't think it has any value. It's a, it's a kenopodium. It does produce a prolific amount of seed. So I would suggest she pull it uh, it doesn't really have a showy flower. She pull it before it uh, shoots seeds out. All right. Uh, one picture on the next one. This comes to us from Republican City. What is this weed, and how did we control it in the flower bed? Um, this is one. I'm, I'm not sure of the species, and so unfortunately, um, it's going to be. It's a sol Solanaceae of some kind, and there's only like 10,000 of them in the in nature. So I didn't really get very exact on that one. Um, it, they should be able to pan pull it because it is an annual. Um, I would suggest that in the in the landscape garden because you know most of those things that are in, are in there are also broadleaf. So I would avoid any herbicides and simply hand pull it. All right, uh, and you have two pictures on the next one, I think. 
Uh, this is all over on the edges of a new sports field that has not been seeded. What is this and how do we control it? Uh, this is puncture vine or goat head, everyone's least favorite weed. And it's called puncture vine because it can puncture um, tires on bikes and, and even small motorcycle tires it's been known to do, scooters, that sort of thing. So uh, it can be a problem with all the inflated, inflated things. But beyond that, on a, on a sports field where they're going to be playing ball on it, they need to get this out of there and they need to scrape that off, spray it and scrape it off and get as much of that goat head seed out of there. Once they get the sports field established, it should be fine because it doesn't do well when you've got a really good thick, dense stand. But I would keep an eye on that as that field matures, make sure, especially in those high traffic areas, that it doesn't return via seed. It's an annual, so you can put a pre-emergent next fall, spring down. Um, Pendomethylin-based products work fine. Prodiamine or barricade-based products work fine as well. Um, but just keep your eye on it because you certainly don't want people rolling around, that they, especially if it's a youth field, because it can hurt. All right. <laughs> you have uh, three on this first one, Amy. This okay. comes to us from Lancaster County, and it's pitch masses on ponderosa pine. Uh, and I know it could perhaps have been caused by one of Jody's creatures, but this is ponderosa. So is this canker or what is this? I would lean toward canker. Um, maybe not right where you're seeing that gumming. I would look up a little bit higher and it will work its way down. Um, just take a look if you have any sunken in areas or bullseye targets on it, that would be canker. And there isn't anything you can do for canker. All right. Uh, two pictures on the next one. This, this is Omaha viewers. They have a flaming fury peach that has sort of this blackish gunk, they're calling it, on the trunk. And they're wondering how they treat it if needed. So that black gummy gunk actually to me looks like sooty mold, that it oozed out some sap and it's, the sap has a lots of sugar, so it's a great opportunity for those saprophytic fungi to move in and cause sooty mold. Um, there isn't anything I would do to treat the tree at this point in time. It's not going to hurt it. All right. Uh, two pictures on the next one. This comes to us from Lincoln. He says, this rose is 10 years old. Uh, it's been in a median, and a couple next to it don't look nearly this bad, but this one looks like this. This one actually made me scratch my head. I mean, this rose looks pretty rotten, I will be honest. Um, it's really yellow, so I want to go toward a virus side, but then it looks like it's nutritional or environmental. I and you said it's in the in strip, the median. Right. in the median. I think it's probably just a combination of heat, stress, and drought, and probably a lack of nutrients and root bound to a certain extent. It's been there for 10 years. It might be a good time to replace that one, just in case it is a virus, which I can't tell from the picture, to prevent the potential movement to the other rose bushes that are in that median. All right, thanks, Amy. And one more, this is a Lincoln viewer who says that these puff Mushrooms appeared literally overnight in Lincoln, and then they flattened out like pancakes. <laughs> Any idea what they are? I do, and do? the fairies love these. They're called paracel mushrooms, green spore paracels, so they can twirl them around when they're creating the fairy rings in your lawn. Nothing you can do for them. <laughs> right. Don't eat them. Do not eat them. All right, thanks. Uh, Elizabeth, three pictures on the first one. This comes to us from Fremont. This is great. They show us the environment. Uh, to the north, the burning bush is drying up. To the south, it's fine. Drought is the assumption. They've tried, soup. they're wondering about extra water, super thrive, or sharpen the ax. Sharpen the ax, it's dead. It's not coming back. All right. And you can see the downspout on the one that is alive. Yep, the one that's got the downspout is alive. The other one possibly has drought. And then in addition to <laughs> reflective heat. Um, so, you know, that's one of the downsides to this one. But, you know, you're probably going to have to rip it out. The hard part is, is it throws off your balance because it's going to, there's no way you're going to get a bigger um, plant at the nursery that's going to match the one on the other side. So I'd go maybe with a different plant so it didn't, so it looks like you did it on purpose. All right, thanks. Two pictures on the next one. This is an Ashland viewer. Uh, he had an ash tree removed. This is the result. Ash suckers wants to know how to uh, get rid of these and then wants a suggestion for a new tree. Probably a little longer discussion than we want to have today. Yeah, so it is an ash, and so what we want to do is we probably want to remove it because it's coming up from the root system. So we want to make sure that we take it out of there. Rock has given several suggestions on ways that we can kill it with, with herbicides, but um, there's a great publication called Trees for Eastern Nebraska that I'd want you to take a look at based on the size. All right, one pick on the next one. What is this plant, friend or foe? 
depends. Um, Cypress Spurge, in some instances, it can be overly aggressive, but if you like it and it's not taking over, I'd go ahead and leave it. All right, and one more, and this is an Ashland viewer who has Egopodium, and there's one green one coming up in the middle. She called it Snow in the Mountain. What does she do about the reversion? Um, you know what? If you can selectively remove that green one, that's going to be your best bet because this plant is fairly aggressive to begin with, and then when we revert to green, we're also aggressive. So if you don't like it, take it out. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Well, we're going to switch gears now, and we're going to see a great segment with a grandma and a grandson who started raising monarchs. Eight-year-old Beckett Johnson loves monarch butterflies. I like all kinds of colored ones. I love that all the patterns they have. They can camo. They have so many patterns of colors: red, all kinds. He loves learning about them, catching them, and even giving each one a name of their own. Monty, um, Lily, all kinds. Beckett found monarchs like Monty and Lily out in the garden, a place he discovered a passion for with his grandma, Cheryl. Ever since he was little, grandma's babysat him. So they have spent a lot of time together. So once he got to be a toddler and he start, could start to like toddle around and walk, they've been outside exploring. With our own boys, being a teacher, I did not want them going to school thinking, where does the potato grow? <laughs> so I always had them help me. So they knew it grew in the ground and, and just realized where their food comes from. And, and these little ones too, uh, they pretty much know where it comes from. Obviously grandma's not just teaching Beckett, she's teaching Piper and they're spending countless hours out exploring together. When they found the milkweed outside, we noticed that he could really find those little caterpillars under the milkweed from looking up underneath them. The look on the milkweed to look for for caterpillars, we see we look for the nibbles. One caterpillar turned into raising that one in a jar, and letting it out, and watching it take off. I think it was the first one. We actually sat by the garage for hours, and we had two chairs. We had pop and we snacked, and that first one would not, did not leave. It just sat on a flower. Once they did one, one grew to two, two grew to three, and three grew to four, and pretty soon we had a whole counter full of caterpillars in jars. She could have on my leg. Yes, but she isn't. They have four stages that they start as an egg and they grow to be a caterpillar. And then they're going to be a caterpillar to a chrysalis. And then after the chrysalis, they start to come out and then pop out as butterflies. Like, when we first started, we just looked here at our grandma's house. But then we started to look in our backyard since there's milkweeds back there. And we started to look back there and we keep on finding butterflies. More and more back in, in our backyard. If one was coming out of a chrysalis, you know, quick, come over, got to see it. Or we'd go up there and and then share that time. They always are calling each other back and forth and going back and forth between our two houses, and it's, it's fun to watch them bond over something so beautiful, just like their relationship has been. That's why they're little. The relationship between the two and the bond they shared over monarchs became even more important earlier this year. Beckett was in the hospital. He was diagnosed with pseudohypoparathyroidism 1B, which is very rare, we find. So essentially, he can't really control his calcium level in his body on his own without some medications. He was in the hospital 17 days, and it was, that was very scary. For me, thinking what's going through his mind, because children can sense things that you don't even know they can sense. Thankfully, the medications are out there and they can help him control that. But it was a tough time in Beckett's life to be cooped up, taken away from his environment of his grandma, his school, his friends. He was on me! Grandma, he was yes, on me! Yes, I saw that. When we finally got to be back home, it was so, so nice for Beckett to be outside and be able to be home with grandma and be in their own environment, back to exploring and getting back to be a normal kid again. They love to explore together. They're truly each other's best friends. Let's go! Bye! Make it not so fast. Okay. 
What a special story, and we're happy to share also that there was another hatch just a couple days ago. So that's just great. All right, one announcement tonight. That announcement is we are still doing the Grow a Row produce, Tuesdays 4.30 to 7, bring that produce. We donate it. We have a lot of questions. We're going fast. Okay. So, Jody, uh, two on this first one. This is, is this a carpenter ant, and if so, should she treat it? She found four or five on the driveway. Yes, this is a carpenter ant worker. No, do not treat outside for five ants. <laughs> All right. Then we have uh, two pictures on the next one. He wants to know what kind of a spider this is. This is the early in the day, and then the second picture is munch a bunch. Yeah, so this is a white banded crab spider, and they're specialists at catching pollinators. So it's the circle of life. This last picture, it's got to be. All right. And then we have two picks on the next one, Jody. This comes to us from North Platte. Uh, she has hostas. Uh, she's wondering, is this slug damage and how to treat if it is? Well, I mean, slugs and snails are common passive hostas, but this doesn't look quite like that. So it could be environmental. It'll be, it'll be fine next year. All right, you'd see slime trails, right? Yeah, you might. And if it's really wet, then you want to like decrease that moisture. Set a beer trap if you're worried about it. All right. Rock, you have one pick on the first one. Uh, this is an Aurora viewer. They live in a new subdivision in Aurora. This is what the soil looks like this week. It's supposed to be seeded before Labor Day. What should be done so the seed will come up? I don't think this is as bad as it looks. A light cultivation and the seed going down, if they're really that worried about it, take a screwdriver and p push it into the ground when the soil's a little bit moist. If it doesn't go in very readily, they might consider a more aggressive cultivation, but it's not as bad as it looks. All right, good to know. Two picks on the next one. This is a Seward viewer trying to get a buffalo grass lawn established. Plugged a section about two weeks ago, and he's wondering how long it will take to fill in, and is there anything he should do? Yeah, it won't fill in this year because we're starting to go into this time of the year when buffalo grass isn't actively growing. It might benefit from a half rate of starter fertilizer yet this fall or in the next couple of weeks, and then again in the spring finish off that uh, starter fertilizer and then finish out with uh, the standard two pounds for a given, especially during the growing year, post June and July of next year. So half, half, and then pound, pound for um, the next six to 10 months. All right. And your next two pictures are these, uh, this is Lincoln. They seeded these two strips after some grading about three weeks ago, put this mat stuff down. Now the turf is coming up through it. They want to know, will that, will it hurt to pull that off? And will that mat degrade? This is not a biodegradable mat. You can just tell there are biodegradable ones that take care of themselves. Pull it up. Be careful when you do that you're not, you know, it's going to pull up some seedlings, but um, if you can mow it one time before you do it, you certainly won't pull as much up and then the mowing, but don't, don't leave it there because it's a great trip hazard. And I can tell because I've done it in my yard. All right. <laughs> Amy, this is a Griswold Iowa viewer sent a pic uh, earlier about hollyhock rust. His follow-up question here is that the fungus will overwinter. He's wondering if, if the hollyhocks come back up next year, will they have the fungus? So the hollyhocks will come back up, but only if we have the spores and the right weather conditions. You might be lucky and not have any next year. All right, two picks on the next one. This is a shroom. He just wants to share the picture. Uh, this, this, and uh, what do you think? I have no idea. I couldn't identify it. Sorry. All right. Two picks on the next one. Uh, Battle Creek, Nebraska, mostly purple cone flowers. Are they supposed to look like this? It is if you're a plant pathologist because it's aster yellows and it's super, super pretty. Now what you want in your garden, rug it out. All right. Elizabeth, two picks. What would cause a carrot to go to seed like this and be long and white? And this is Nemaha County. Uh, cultivar will determine the color and it's two years old because it goes to seed. All right. Two picks on the next one. All the tomatoes are ripening like this. Is it too much rain or direct sun? Environmental, which is everything under the sun. <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> and one more. And this is Omaha. And this tomato grew a nose. What in the world? Again, environmental. Uh, we couldn't predict that even if we tried. 